Next, we'll bring you two panels from the gathering. First, journalists examine the state of the news media during the Trump presidency. After that, a group of attorneys look at the rule of law, the Trump administration's legal policies, and recent Supreme Court decisions. Reality Check Live is there to bring you this special report. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this luncheon because the topic we're here to discuss is near and dear to my heart. Just as all of you are doing in your home states, here in Texas, uh, we've been fighting for racial justice, LGBT equality, reproductive rights, religious liberties, and all too often these days, immigrant rights. For 32 years, I worked in the newspaper business. I cut my teeth as a reporter in Connecticut. Where's Connecticut out there? Good. Had we had autofill back then, it would have been so much easier for me to get indicted politician on the screen uh, every night. But I ended my newspaper career back home in Texas, not long after Rick Perry put his arm around my shoulders and told a crowd he was proud I was his hometown newspaper editor. Cause and effect, perhaps. <laughs> so it's obvious the media and the First Amendment are things I've dealt with pretty much every day of my adult life. And now those issues are something all of us are dealing with every day. I still think the mission of journalism is to shine light on wrongs, to hold the powerful accountable, to broaden our horizons. Yet we hear daily reports about fake news, disinformation, distortions, about a total disruption of the news media. What does it mean for our constitutional democracy and freedom of expression? This is an important discussion and nowhere is it more important than right here, right now, as we ACLU members seek to learn to be inspired and to arm ourselves with the knowledge and the arguments we need to continue our vigorous defense of the First Amendment. To help us do that today, we have an excellent panel, one that represents a variety of media and of viewpoints, and I think you will know their names. First of all, there's David Keene, who's been the opinion editor of the Washington Times, the president of the National Rifle Association, a political consultant, and a presidential advisor, among his many other accomplishments. He has collaborated with the ACLU on such issues as prison reform and limiting government surveillance activities. A distinguished reporter, editor, and columnist for the Washington Post, Ruth Marcus has been with the newspaper for nearly 35 years, ever since she graduated from Harvard Law School. She's currently deputy editorial page editor, and for her weekly column, has been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in commentary. Katrina Vandenhuvel is editor and publisher of The Nation. She's written for just about every major newspaper in the country, and she's a frequent contributor on television news shows. For her work on behalf of civil liberties, she's received awards from, among others, the New York Civil Liberties Union, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, and the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, Katrina Vandenhubel. So I want to welcome all three of them to the stage now. Yes, David, we're putting you in the middle. <laughs> we hope that's a comfortable spot for you. <laughs> so before we start, we want to know a bit about you and your news consumption. So I'm going to ask some questions. All you have to do is raise your hand. This first round, you can raise your hand multiple times. There's no one answer. 
Where is the first place you turn every morning for news? Facebook? Twitter? Do you go to your local newspapers? Whoa, who said no? no. <laughs> How about your national newspapers? The Washington Post, the LA Times, the New York Times. Oh, okay, all right. This is an ACLU crowd. How about, how about local television? There's sort of a room divide here, I think. Uh, what about cable television? Okay. Raise your hand if you've increased your media consumption in the last 18 months. So now that you're getting more news, do you trust the media? Oh, guys, I'm worried about you guys. I'm glad I got out. Um, do, you, do you think the media holds our institutions and elected leaders accountable? It can't. Well, I think we see that there's a whole new landscape here from when some of us started in this business. In the space, you know, of a little more than 55 years, We've gone from a president who held an average of 23 televised press conferences a year to today and a president who averages 10 tweets per day, many of them directed at our institutions, including the press. Uh, he wants to reach the people directly. We have gone from all of us getting our news the same way, from journalists exercising judgment providing breadth and depth and analysis, to the democratization of information, to those places you mentioned you get your news, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, search engine, news pages, online sites, some that we may or may not know whether they really use what we once thought of as professional journalists. 25,000 newsroom jobs have been lost in the past decade. Some of our neighbors would say that's a good thing. We have a president who won overwhelmingly in regions with low newspaper subscription rates. And we have journeyed from a period where newsroom conversations once centered on things like whether a story had the right context, did it tell you why you should care, to a media landscape seemingly dominated by clickbait in places we never before would have called centers of journalism. So our conversation today could have been an all-day symposium, but instead we have about an hour and a half, and we're gonna divide this up in a couple of parts, starting with how did we arrive at the state of the media in the age of Trump, and where does it, and therefore we, go in the future? I expect this group will have a robust conversation. They are not without opinions. Uh, and I have a conversation starter or two, and then uh, I probably will just stay out of the way. In March, Katrina, in your magazine, Tom Englehart wrote uh, that every single day is a new tweet storm, a new Trump dawn, a new outrageous statement or policy, a new lie or misstatement, a new bit of news about Stormy Daniels, and on and on and on. So how did we arrive at this moment? Does this president use Twitter to distract us uh, from the real catastrophes of the administration, as you wrote Saturday, Ruth? Me? This is a very dangerous moment, um, not just for the media, but for institutions, rule of law, those institutions which check a president and an administration. I think it's particularly dangerous because this president and his war on the media and by the way, the war on the media isn't just Donald Trump saying the media is the enemy of the people. Today, as some of you may know, is the end of net neutrality as we know it. And I think that is a real free speech fight of our generation and the ACLU and attorneys generals around this country will continue to fight for that freedom. But it means that you're giving our use of the internet over to big telecom and that is a disaster. But the structural changes in the media which were happening before Donald Trump, collide with Donald Trump. So you've seen the consolidation of media, you've seen the loss of local journalism, the loss of 
loss of journalist jobs. You've seen the obliteration of the line between news and entertainment. So that a reality show star like Donald Trump could go down that escalator and a media, and by the way, there are different media in this country. We should use that as a predicate, it seems to me, for this discussion. Because there is the nation, there's democracy now, there are New York Times, the Washington Post, and then there, I will say that I think cable, in many ways for these last two years, has not served the public interest for the most part, and has gone for clickbait cable style, media malpractice over public interest news. So I think we face this moment where structural changes in the media collide with a president who is determined to delegitimize the media's role as a check on his power. But let me end. It's not just this president. There was an Italian journalist who covered Silvio Berlusconi. You know who he was. He's still lurking around the political landscape. But he was someone like Trump. And that journalist said, it would be a mistake to focus too much on Trump's character and the man, because it will allow him to portray himself as the victim versus the establishment. Focus on the sources of Trumpism, because we will have Trumpism after Trump leaves the stage, and the media would do well, and at its best, many of the media institutions I cited favorably do this. Look at the sources of Trump's strength, economic, social, political factors, because that election in 2016, the media played a role, but so did the fact that I would argue, and I'll stop, it was the first election of the post-financial crisis in this country. Millions of people felt left behind, they weren't being listened to, there was a backlash against the first African-American president, that's not news to you, but I think we need to fix hard on the structural needs to build a public interest, rebuild a public interest media, focus on the sources of Trumpism, and don't allow him to make the media this elite institution because there is a fundamental need for a public interest media in this country if we are going to preserve democracy and the resilience of our institutions like the ACLU. Who wants to jump in there? Me? David. I'm an older guy and sometimes I don't hear the monitor. Uh, much of what you say about the structural changes are true. Uh, and have been going on forever. You know, politicians have never liked the media, uh, and for good reason, and they're not supposed to. But uh, when I first came to Washington and was involved in presidential politics, Ruth, will, Ruth well, she was a young girl then. She'll remember some of it. You might mention I still am, but that's okay. <laughs> if, if somebody wanted to run for president, they actually had to go to dinners in Georgetown with leading journalists, Scotty Reston and all these people, and be vetted. That was the first primary. If, they, if all of these people decided within the establishment that the candidate was okay, he'd get mentioned, uh, possibly could run, et cetera, et cetera. That began to break down. And every candidate in both parties was trying to find ways around that. And what we have now is the breakdown, which is partly technological and structural, uh, and candidates trying to take advantage of that to get their message out in the way they want it, rather than the way it's filtered by the existing media and it's technology that's enabled them to do that. I remember in the, in the Nixon years, the, the president would go around and ban the national press from press conferences because uh, he wanted the local people, he could get his message out that way because they'd cover it differently. That worked a little bit, not as much as he'd like to. Other candidates tried different things. Uh, I remember when I was working for Ronald Reagan, uh, he, um, he went to Florida and uh, we were trying to get a specific message out and he gave his uh, head a press conference and all the national media got it because it was, it was a different message than they'd been hearing. The local media who we were targeting didn't get it because they liked the general lines that he'd been using so the wrong story was in the wrong place and we had to bring him back to have a press conference where he would just talk about that so they'd get it through their heads. But what happens when you have an infrastructure that breaks down and when you have multiple ways to reach people, you have the kind of chaos that takes place when you're also free. The other problem that we have which, which goes into that is, you know, many years ago, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said we're all, we we're all have a right to our own opinions, but not to our own facts. Well, it turns out that we do have a right to our own facts. Uh, everybody, <laughs> if, you, if you just watch uh, MSNBC or Fox News, 
you don't get just different opinions, you get different facts. And it's reflected in public polls. 20 years ago, if you asked voters about the state of the economy, you'd get a sense that it was an economic answer. Today, if you ask voters, and if it's a Republican president, the Democrats will say everything's terrible, the Republicans will say it's great, regardless of what it is. And the same is true the other way around. So the answers to questions that used to be issue-based are now simply politically based as we break up into a, uh, into a society where, we, where we, we get our news in a boutique way. When we grew up, the, old, the older people among us, there weren't, and there were the, I've talked about the negatives of that, but there was a source of facts and news. And we could disagree with it, I often did, but we were all operating on the same plane. Today, as, uh, and I think President Obama said it at one point, we live on different planets. Uh, we not only don't agree on the solutions, we don't even agree on the problems. And, that, and that's part of the chaos that's, that's, uh, that's going on. Probably that'll be resolved in some way, but I don't think it would be possible to predict how it is. The only thing I'll add is that, and this is a generational thing in part, uh, when you raised your hands about how many get your news on Twitter and Facebook, I don't do either one of those. But at the Washington Times or at the Post, I'm sure this is true, we get a certain number of op-ed pieces over the transom, if you will. Uh, and sometimes from people that you don't know, and some of them are pretty good. And if I get back to them and say, we're filled up in the print edition, but we could put it online, their response tells me how old they are. Because, <laughs> because if they're my age, if it isn't printed on paper, right. it really doesn't exist. And right. if it's a younger writer, they say, okay, what's the print mm, that's fine. <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, but I, I think that that structural chaos, which can be both destructive and constructive, is something that everybody's trying to live with and grasp. I think Ruth wants to jump in, but I see in a minute, Katrina, will come back to you. I think you're so, eager to answer that. So, you know, the, the marriage of the Trump moment and the technological moment is a really interesting phenomenon. Every president I didn't know about the Nixon story about trying to exclude the national press, but every president has tried to find his way of going around, going over the heads of circumventing certainly the national media and you know getting terrific headlines from local newspapers when local newspapers were thriving enough to have people to cover them. But Trump has just... Um, taken advantage of this technological moment where you can, he can communicate unfiltered with all of these people. I looked, when I looked at his Twitter feed the other day, I think he was above 50 million followers. And this stark fact that a president of the United States has had a single full-fledged news conference in this 500 plus and counting days of his presidency really tells you everything you need to know about the president and the media right now. In some ways, he is the most bizarrely accessible of candidates. He uh, calls some reporters directly. He answers lots of questions. And yet, he's not held accountable um, in the normal mechanisms that we have all grown up with and expect to be held accountable. And then we forget sometimes to say, whoa, this is a really strange moment that's going on here, that we have a president without White House press conferences. I, we, a normal president would have had X by this point in his presidency. He has had one. Um, and then we you get into this debate about how a responsible news organization should cover his tweets. Do you cover his tweets as if they are, I love the feed that puts them up on kind of official looking White House letterhead and really helps put it in context for you? Um, or, do you or do you understand, so do you understand them as official policy that should be reacted to? Or do you understand them as a distraction mechanism? And I think the answer is you have to understand them um, both simultaneously as both and walk and chew gum at the same time, write about the tweets for what they're worth and the ones that are worth lamenting and responding to, to respond to them and not to allow the tweets to 
um, serve as a distraction mechanism to distract you from the underlying policy that's being made while we're all mesmerized by Twitter. This is a really hard phenomenon, and it's a particularly hard phenomenon as the Trump moment um, collides with the basic destruction of the natural um, pre-existing financial model for the news industry. And we've tried to find something else. In a weird way, Trump has ameliorated, at least temporarily, some of that problem, even though um, there may be some degree of news fatigue. There is also on cable news, in um, newspaper, eyeballs, um, definitely an up he has created with the, his reality show presidency an uptick of interest. Uh, you know, he said incorrectly, I believe, um, we'll all be rooting for him and urging his reelection because we won't, he can only understand the way we think of our jobs in financial terms because what will we do when he's gone? What will, you know, our, maybe our subscriptions will collapse, maybe our viewership on television will go down. That's not true, but um, in some ways, I'm gonna end the sort of beginning of this on a hopeful note. The Trump moment for me as a journalist has actually brought something I've never experienced before. I know there was some grumbling in the room about the degree to which the media is capable of holding the president accountable, but for the first time in my well, how much was I outed for? 35 plus years of being a journalist. Um, people are thanking me for what we're doing, and it's not me, it's the news media generally. That is a new thing, as you have a president who describes what you do for a living as being the enemy of the people. At least some of the people recognize that we do play an important role, and that's kind of, for me, the upside of the Trump administration. Yeah. You know, Ruth, at the Washington Times, we get thanked all the time for publishing stuff that you don't publish in the Post. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I come back again. You know, I, we are living in a radically changing time, and sometimes when you're living through that history, it's not, it's, it, those on the front lines are experiencing it in very painful ways, but it's the old order is disappearing or dying, and the new one is not yet born. The media order is one of, is part of that. And I come back again. The tr tr I was reminded of this by the ominous story the other day of um, the Trump administration beginning a leak investigation and r seizing a journalist, and there may be three others, emails and notes. A lot of people in the country may not think that's a danger. I think it's an extraordinary danger and an ominous sign of this Justice Department's willingness to curb the press. On the other hand, we can't live <clears throat> ahistorically. I think uh, several people in the media quickly noted that President Obama left a template with the use of the Espionage Act. Some of you that may have known Thomas Drake, certainly what happened to Snowden, <clears throat> who I think deserves a pardon. I disagree with my <laughs> colleagues at the Washington Post, but I think he did a public service. So I, I think we need to put some of what we're living through in a historical context, then that may be too much to ask. It may be very nation-esque because we were founded in 1865 by abolitionists. And just like the ACLU founded in 1920, we think this is our moment to show resistance and renewal in a different way. But I, I think we need some history here. Just a footnote on Snowden who languishes in Moscow and sp speaks out against abuses there. But I am, I'm horrified, I have to say, by how many in former intelligence heads have been signed up as talking heads on cable. You may not, but I mean, Clapper perjured himself twice, yet he's there giving advice to all of us about how to combat intelligence lapses. Bring back Snowden to be a commentator, MSNBC or CNN. That would be more helpful. And I will, sim I will say that I think you're so right, David. I mean, there's a breakdown of the public sphere, but at the same time, in the olden days, there, was all there were gatekeepers. There were gatekeepers who defined and policed the parameters of what was possible by way of opinion. 
And I think in the chaos, there's also an That's upside. That's the plus side. Of there's it. a plus side because those whose voices were not heard or were considered marginal now can have a voice, but that has its downsides too. So it's a complex. Well, the tribal nature of our politics uh, today is one of the, you, and you hit upon it with the, uh, I had hoped that after the Obama administration, we'd be past this period of going after reporters and yes. their, because that was, of course, that happened more during the Obama administration than the entire, since Woodrow Wilson. Uh, yes, we know. But, uh, but, we're, but we're not. But what's interesting, but I remember when Clapper first uh, perjured himself before Congress, I wrote that he should resign, he should be fired, he should be gotten rid of. Uh, and uh, the left was all for that because it was on an issue that we share. Right. Now Clapper, for some reason, is a hero because he's attacking Donald Trump. He's the same lying intelligence officer who who pursues his own beliefs today I that he was then. I agree with you. <laughs> that I agree with. <laughs> let, let me jump in here a second and take us a little different direction. You, you've all made reference to the way it used to be when you started out, when I started out. So, you know, and I've talked to a lot of reporters in the last few weeks who said, in some ways they think this may be the new golden age of television, of television, of television and print and brought, you know, all forms of journalism. Um, but how is it changing the way you do your work? I mean, Katrina, you're an editor. You both run editorial pages. Uh, so not just in what you write, but in how you direct your staffs, how you choose. What's the it? What, I mean, what is the it? How is what changing? Is how, how is Trump changing? No, how, how, is, how has that changed the way you approach, in your case, opinion writing, in your case, choosing news articles and things to investigate. Uh, is there a so new approach? How has Trump changed it? Mm -hmm. So um, actually for us, it's been a really fascinating challenge. We have a very diverse, um, uh, I would say op-ed page, but it's not a page anymore. First of all, there are two pages <laughs> in the print paper for those who still see the print paper on most days of op-ed columns but it's an op-ed section that um, has an uh, abundance of opinion online that ranges the gamut. One, but one of the things that we discovered in the age of Trump was that our conservative columnists um, actually were more anti-Trump than our liberal columnists. Um, they were, you know, who disliked Trump most? Was it Michael Gerson or George Will or, God bless him, Charles Krauthammer? And it created a big challenge for us because what was once a kind of vibrant fray of disagreement among liberal and conservative columnists just became this we hate Donald Trump echo chamber, which is actually not a healthy place if you want a vibrant opinion section. So we actually had to do something that I know people in this room um, would not be encouraging us to do necessarily or thinking we should be spending all of our energy doing, but trying to find, um, like Diogenes, um, intellectually honest pro-Trump or at least Trump empathetic columnists. And that has really, that has been one of the central challenges for me as an op-ed editor of the Trump era. Um, the second, which is related, has been to make sure that as both as a columnist, as an editor, we don't either um, overreact to Trump or underreact to Trump. That um, there are things that the president is doing that are things that any Republican president or most Republican presidents would do that I happen to disagree with, that the editorial board might disagree with, but are kind of within the norms of Republican presidential behavior, and that means that we should respond to them accordingly. I disagree, I lament this, we should stop it, but it's not, you know, fascism, incipient fascism, authoritarianism. But at the same time, we shouldn't, um, underreact to things that Donald Trump does that are not like what a normal president does. I mentioned before the failure to hold news conferences, the calling the press the enemy of the people. Um, as much as 
this very disturbing um, seizure of the basically metadata from the reporter had its antecedents in behaviors of the Obama administration, behaviors that if they weren't um, completely contained by at least um, were kind of dealt with in some guidelines that would make that a uh, rare occurrence guidelines that it's a little bit unclear whether or not they're enforced. Um, just because um, there are 10 outrages in the space of a single tweet storm or 10 outrages in the space of a day, that doesn't mean that we should only react to two of them. We need to figure out a way, and it's really hard in an era of constrained resources, but we need to figure out really hard how to respond to all of them. I had a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted to yell about last week and decided I was going to use my column to write about the administration's really um, lamentable decision not to defend the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act, not just because of the impact on the health care law, but uh, because of the impact on the rule of law and the really terrible precedent it sets, except in the most extreme cases for an uh, administration to defend um, duly enacted congressional statutes. Um, so that not underreact, not overreaction, but also in particular not underreaction to the excesses of this administration is for me the kind of central challenge of the Trump era. Katrina, how, how are you approaching your work, if differently or not? Well, the morning after Trump was elected, uh, we came in bleary-eyed and we did a cover, Mourn, Resist, Organize, Onwards, um, which was a template uh, in some ways. But, you know, we've continued, founded in 1865, not to make a profit, but to make change, and in the belief that our journalism can build a more democratic and equitable world. I'd say there are four areas we continue to build out in this Trump era. We did hire an immigrant rights reporter, a racial justice reporter. We were committed to covering those on the front lines of what we quickly saw would be injustice. But we have covered insurgency and progressive politics for 153 years, and we ramped up in the fundamental belief that social movements make transformational change. So we've been covering Black Lives Matter, uh, the Me Too movement, Never Again, uh, the environmental rights movement, economic justice. This was in our DNA. We covered the Bernie Sanders campaign. I will say that what Bernie Sanders did, put aside whether you love him, hate him, or don't care about him, he put issues on the agenda that have now become part of our debate and discourse, and we follow those issues. Fight for 15, free higher ed, Medicare for all, racial justice issues. War and peace. Those don't go away. I mean, if there's an enduring strain, also, I mean, the ACLU was founded by anti-war activists. Um, but war and peace is not high enough on, we believe, an agenda. And then when there's talk of a president like Trump with his finger on the nuclear button, that gets people a little more interested in war and peace issues. Yet, we also say, hey, Democrats, why are you voting to give this president more defense budget money when you're so worried about him? So we try to keep it, we were one of the few publications to oppose the war in Iraq vigorously. I'm glad Senator McCain now sees what a disaster it was. We try to do investigative reporting with, um, Ruth talks about limited resources. We have limited resources, but I'm very proud that on the eve of the Trump election, our coverage of the federal for-profit prison industry led Sally Yates, then deputy at the DOJ, to announce they were shutting them down. We gotta go back in and do that work again to make change. Because I, I will end, there's, you know, I don't know about Ruth or David, but there's no question that as a journalist in these times, as an editor, you wake up some mornings with some despair. Because you look out and you're, part of journalism is to shame to make change. And when you have not just Trump, but a lot of people around him who seem incapable of being shamed, you wonder what is my work accomplishing? What is the change? You got to be in it for the long haul. And the investigative journalism is part of that, making change through exposing, through proposing, through arousing people's attention and enlisting the movements and just people. And finally, I will say what part of what we try to do is put new ideas on the agenda. I mean, I 
think we, sh you know, Medicare for all is something we've been championing for 20 years. Um, and I think, you know, we should, we should seed, I we should seed ideas that may seem radical, like, you know, abolish the Second Amendment. No, okay. Um, <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I know, and I, I'm not sure, but I, I mean, but what we try to do is, or abolish prison, I mean, there are a whole set of issues that may seem radical, but you have to wake up with that radical. In these times, it seems to me, it's important for the nation and the nation and the ACLU in the great work it does. And I, our cover story a few weeks ago was about the ACLU playing a larger role in, in, its, in, it, in the spirit of the ACLU in changing the politics of this country. And I know there's, you know, there is complexity in that, but I think it's a moment, and I think the ACLU was founded in that spirit. And so I'll stop and simply say that one of the things we have are great scholars on our editorial board. One of them is Eric Foner, who writes about the Civil War and Reconstruction. Love Eric Foner. So during the campaign of 2016, he emailed one night, he emails late at night, and he said, does anyone there have a tie to the Bernie Sanders campaign? And I said, yeah, can you tell Bernie Sanders to stop talking about Denmark? I love Denmark, but can he retrieve this country's own radical traditions which exist to remind people of what is possible, even in the darkest times, which these are close to? I would submit that we've seen dark times before. This country is resilient. Institutions are resilient. And the judicial resistance, which the ACLU is so central a part of, has fought some, you know, has fought and won. It is a long battle, it is defensive mostly, but that judicial resistance reminds of why a media that checks and is legitimate and continues the work even if a president calls it fake news is so vital. David, do you want to weigh in on something other than repealing the Second Amendment? In the <laughs> <laughs> At, 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 the, at the Washington Times, and one caveat, I'm no longer the full opinion editor. I'm now a, a editor at large because I spend more time fishing than I do editing, and I write a column. But let me, let me just talk about the, the way we look at it, because we have three things. One, I don't know that, uh, I, I try to, we have to do some of this reaction because that's what readers expect. Uh, but we're not about pro-Donald Trump or anti-Donald Trump. We're about certain principles. And we try to get those principles out. We're also about accomplishing things. I mean, it's interesting because we're the, we are the conservative alternative in Washington. Uh, the first op-ed that, that was published when I, when I took over the editorial page of the Washington Times was written by some fellow by the name of Romero. <laughs> As he'll remember that. Uh, because we believe that in order to accomplish goals, and there are a lot of goals that people share, they need to work together. Now, I know that 97% of the people in this room, my wife's here, so that's two of us, are not hostile to much, to, to much of what Donald Trump is doing. We happen to like a lot of the agenda. He wasn't my candidate uh, for president, uh, but uh, the, the change that that we see and the change that you might see are very different things. That's legitimate, and that's what we should be fighting about. But just opposing everything because it's the other team, as you will. One of the, one of the things that I really dislike in Washington is our team and their team. It doesn't work that way, at least in my mind. There are things that we all want to accomplish, some things that she wants to accomplish, some things that I might want to accomplish, but the things that we all ought to want to accomplish, we ought to work together on. And I think that's incredibly important. It was, it's, and conservatives and particularly the ACLU have worked together over many years. I have, some of my closest friends in Washington uh, have been uh, uh, activists with the ACLU. Back in the Nixon era, your younger members won't remember some of these people, but Chuck Morgan, more recently Laura Murphy, uh, Joel Gora in New York, Anthony. I mean, there are areas where we believe in individual freedom. Uh, and, and, and one of the things, and I'd like to, this maybe is for a later part of the discussion, but I think that it's important to remember what we're about 
and what your organization and other organizations are about and not simply get into a political or tribal food fight uh, that, that, that not just obscures but makes it more difficult to make real progress on issues that are incredibly important. Uh, you know, to, uh, today we have, we have greater assaults on our privacy and on many of these things than we've ever had. And we don't know how to deal with it. And we're also faced with a generation that to some degree doesn't much care about it. Uh, and that makes it even more difficult. But these are important questions. And they shouldn't be buried by the fact that we like Joe and we don't like Bill or whatever. Uh, they, should be, they should get people of like mind to get together, to work together, to accomplish real things. So you, uh, I think all of you mentioned agenda setting in one way or another. Uh, we saw not a lot of hands went up about trusting the media, uh, about the, and the media's ability to hold elected officials, public officials accountable. So, but in the old days, I mean, we had thought about editorial pages as a place to set an agenda, uh, to, to lead local conversations, sort of be that, that town square uh, of discussion and debate. Uh, Katrina, you talk about investigative reporting uh, leading the way, but too often I hear from some folks that they think that's biased uh, journalism. And of course, I contend it's a bias when you, the day you decide what you're going to cover, you're, you're showing a bias. But, but how do you overcome this feeling that the agenda setting is really a conservative, a liberal bias? Yeah, that probably affects us, because uh, I, was, I was asked by a producer for one of the networks um, not too long ago to sit down off the record and talk to him about certain things. And I said, you know, if this was 20 years ago, I'd do it, uh, because uh, 20 years ago, people observe the, the, uh, the norms. And if I said something off the record, it would be off the record. Today, that's not so true. Uh, and I said, so I don't think I'll do that. And he said, well, I really can't blame you. <laughs> you know, because we live in a different world and we live in a world now, and here's the difference. And when, when, uh, when 15 years ago, 10 years ago, reporters, whether they're conservatives or liberals or whatever, they're all biased in their minds. Right. We all are. We all have certain beliefs. We all have certain things we hold very, very dear. Uh, but there was a professional desire to, to try to not let that show up in reporting. Now we're in an era where the New York Times, for example, said reporters have an obligation to let their views on Donald Trump affect their reporting because it's sort of a crusade. Well, you can't expect the people on the other side not to react to that, uh, and and today's in today's world, it's a very different kind of world you're dealing with than you were some years ago. I mean, I I've been involved in in politics as a side from journalism in this town for more, more than 40 years, uh, and in all that time, I've never had well until in the last two or three years, never had a problem dealing with any journalist. You sometimes had a problem dealing with a local journalist who would do, who would kill his grandmother to get to, the, to, to get to Washington. But with Washington journalists, you didn't. You could talk to them, you could deal with them, they would agree with you or disagree with you. And that's changed and conservatives feel very cornered by this and, and fight back. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that others don't feel the same way because uh, somebody told me once that the reason people don't trust the media is that Years ago, in their local paper, when their kid played on a junior high school football team, and the report appeared in the paper, it was wrong. <laughs> and so everybody knows that reporters get things wrong, right. and then they decide when they reporter report something they don't like that it was probably wrong. And so that's true the, of all of us. This really links up to um, some of the previous conversation about the challenges for the media in the age of Trump. To me, an another one of the central challenges is. Um, when he is calling you the enemy of the people, when he is at rallies describing reporters as scum, what are reporters who are supposed to be, and I think for the most part, certainly when I was a news reporter, strove to be fair and objective, how are they to respond? And simultaneously, how, how do you cover fairly 
a political candidate and now a president who says things that are demonstrably untrue. And I know there's a lot of frustration on the left with failing to call out lies. Um, I, I am not actually a big believer in using the word lie because it imagines an ability to get inside somebody's head, which I personally don't have, but I think that news organizations have struggled. We first created fact checkers and then in the 2016 campaign kind of embedded the fact checking in the body of news stories and then when it was warranted embedded the fact checking in the headlines of news stories and then when it was super warranted, when it was clear that um, you knew that you were saying something that we could show that you knew to be untrue. That's the occasion, from my point of view, when you use the word lie. But he has created a whole set of challenges for people who, I mean, I'm an opinion writer now, um, but I used to be a news reporter. My job as a news reporter was completely different. Yep. He has created a lot of challenges for people who are in that position. Marty Barron, the executive editor, and I'm not sucking up to him but of the Washington Post because he's not the boss of me. I don't report to him. But he gets it exactly right. He says, we don't go to war, we go to work when we're attacked by the president. But that's very hard as a matter of human nature to sustain. And I see a lot on social media where I think people, um, my colleagues in newsrooms across, the, across town are not serving themselves or their news organizations very well by responding in kind rather than simply continuing to do their jobs and letting, reporting the facts and letting the facts speak for themselves. And when you set yourself, when you allow the president to turn you into the opposition, then you create your own set of oppositions and that's not a healthy I'm not. I'm not sure that the, that, that it, that the, that the uh, building of one side of the opposition was all but part of one side, if you, if you know. I mean, this was a mutual hostility. I will say this, that, uh, I mean, as you know, not just today, but before, there are a lot of reporters who feel about presidents and politicians the way Donald Trump seems to feel about some reporters. The difference on, on all sides is that we, that those things used to not be out in the public. Part of the problem is not and this is, this is the sort of the changing age where everything we say uh, is in public. And uh, <coughs> well, my politicians always, shouldn't my, do that, neither should other people. Well, my father always told me never to do anything that you wouldn't be ashamed of if it appeared on the front page of the New York Times. Well, I, was, yeah, I always use the example that years ago, when, before the fax machine, if somebody got mad and they wrote a letter and they had a secretary, the secretary would stick it in the drawer. But let me, let me and then back. they got a fax machine and things got worse and now they have a Twitter account. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I, someday I'm gonna patent, uh, maybe it exists, uh, someone told me there's an app where you can, it gets shut down at a certain alcohol meter. Because that I think has caused a lot, <laughs> Three -day waiting of, period. A lot of trouble for many people. But I wanted to come back, this whole idea. Now where I sit, and I respect what Ruth said, about, you know, you were a news reporter, now you're an opinion editor. But at The Nation, I mean, there was a really interesting debate, if you haven't, if you have a chance to check it out, it was between Glenn Greenwald, someone I think highly of, and his Twitter feed is worth reading. Uh, but it was a de debate between Glenn Greenwald and the former editor of The New York Times, Bill Keller, on objective versus adversarial journalism. And I think, and other people thought so too, that Greenwald came out a little bit ahead because what he's basically saying, and I, that this is what, where the nation stands, and it's not fair and balanced and all of that pap, but it's being honest about where you sit or stand and disclosing your values and your principles, but never giving up on the core, which is fact, evidence, and verifiable data. And I think in there... That's right. Even if they are different facts. Well, the whole issue, I mean, the one danger about the Trump administration right now is how many uh, agencies are having data, either funding to collect data suppressed or cut, and that, uh, that has long-term consequences. But read this debate, because the idea of objectivity, in my mind, has always been a complex one, because we all sit and stand in different places. And I do think you've witnessed the seeping of opinion into, a, quote, objective news stories without the requisite honesty about where you stand. So I think that's an important debate to be had in terms of standing for principles, 
Absolutely. I mean, after this event, I hope to go meet a congressperson you should all learn about named Ro Khanna, who's been a leader and a fighter, a number of issues, and then maybe go see Senator Rand Paul. These two people have written an op-ed together on the need for restraint and realism in our foreign policy, and Rand Paul wrote an op-ed with Kamala Harris just a few months ago, I believe, on bail reform. So there are fundamental issues where you can subsume your differences, and we certainly have differences, major differences, but find those areas of principled agreement. And I think that story needs to be told more because there is more of that than is in the news where it is often polarization and tribalism, terms I don't like. And I think the ACLU has stood for principle and I um, recommend that debate because I do think we're in a moment where, I will say one last thing, it is true what Ruth says, this president has actually tried to incite journalists, uh, what? has tried to incite violence against journalists at rallies. So even while one tries to bring history to bear again, and one who can forget Spiro Agnew, the nabobs of negativism, and the attack on the media and journalists as elites is not a new one, but this has a new edge to it. But I would say that journalism as a profession has fed some of that, not in any way allowing incitement to violence, but there's a professionalization of the profession, <clears throat> which does lead to a disconnect with people because it becomes, there, there, let's say we could use more humility. There could be more humility in, and, and your executive editor is right. Don't go to work, go to work. Do the work, show the work, because that I think is. Right, but you and I have actually a slightly different definition of what the, what the work is or should be, because I really well, do think that the, the work, not of opinion journalists like me, but of my colleagues in the newsroom, needs to be to not respond to those provocations and to continue to do their jobs, even when, for example, the other day, a spokesman at the Environmental Protection Agency referred to a reporter as a piece of trash. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not my, saying In my world, or, you know what you do, the best thing you can do is write it down and tell it to people. When I say adversarial journalism, I mean holding the powerful, whatever party, government, corporate power, accountable. I don't mean calling Donald Trump a scumbag or, you know, going low. When perfect. they go low, we should go high or local, I don't know. But I mean, I, I mean adversarial in the sense of holding accountable the power. I have to uh, okay. <laughs> raise a historical point. Uh, I came to town to work for Vice President Spiro Agnew in 1970. <laughs> what uh, can I say? And uh, some of you, will, most of you won't remember what, what you were referring to as the famous the Des Moines speech. Nattering. No, that was a, that was that a was campaign different. thing. That wasn't in the speech. The Des Moines speech was the famous attack on the print media that Agnew delivered in, in Iowa. And uh, as a result of that, and historians, if I said this, we have op-ed pages. Because what happened was all the publishers and editors said, we are not biased, we better get Bill Sapphire, we better get all these people, we better hire them to show that we have both sides. So we should talk about the good as well as what you think is the negative. So uh, I want to get to the future of journalism, but before we go, let's, one last question. Bill Clinton said uh, that the press went easy on Barack Obama. The what? That the <laughs> press went easy on Barack Obama. And a whole host of folks on the right say that the media has been incredibly unfair to President Trump. Discuss. Who, who are you asking, me? Uh, let's start with Katrina. We'll just come right down the so, line. When did President Clinton say this? He's been so busy the last week. <laughs> it was right in the middle of all of that. <laughs> he said that he thought that the press had gone easy on Barack Obama because he was the first black president. I, don't, I, don't, I think that's too glib, and I think that parts of the media in this country went berserk about President Obama. I mean, the... the Pass, uh, his birth certificate and all the conspiracies. Um, you know, the, I can speak for myself that the nation, we were often too tough, 
leading his press secretary, Obama's press secretary at one point, if people remember, to attack the professional left. And I think in retrospect, in the belief that you need an inside-outside strategy and you want to push a president to be more, in, you know, listen to movements and take, diff take certain steps, there has to be a different calibration. But President Obama, I think he was savaged by core elements of the press in this country. So has the press been fair to President Trump? Um, I think, again, I come back. I think the problem with the coverage of President Trump, and it said with humility, because it's not the case all around, is it's too fixated on the palace intrigue, the scandals, the man, and the character. How can you not? But at a certain level, we're playing his game because it becomes all about Trump and not about <laughs> the forces that will continue to afflict our country after Trump is gone. So I think in that sense, we need a recalibration. David? I, I, I rarely agree with things that Bill Clinton says, but I think he's a little bit right about this. I don't know what the motives were, but I, I'd like to use a concrete example. Uh, back during the Bush administration, uh, the press was all over, uh, and properly so, against uh, violations of privacy, overreach on the name of security, and the, and the like. Uh, and I remember, and, and I agreed, I wrote a lot about that I, that I thought the Bush administration was overreaching after 9-11, that they were misusing power, that a lot of this power shouldn't be given to the government, and that there should be, there should be a, a little reason involved. Uh, but I, I stood up at one of the meetings of the coalition and I said, you know, I'm willing to join in the criticism of Bush. What's going to happen when your guy is in? And I related the story that uh, when the uh, Patriot Act was up to be passed, uh, to my, I, I, uh, Paul Weirich, who was yeah. in the, service, the late Paul Weirich and I, were two of the major critics of the Patriot Act. And the Justice Department sent some people to see Paul. He called me right after. And he said, we know this is extraordinary power, but you have nothing to, do, nothing to worry about because we're the good guys. And, uh, and he said, well, what about when the bad guys have that power? They didn't come to me because I'm so obstinate that they knew that probably a visit was of, of no value. I said, Paul, I'm worried about when the good guys have the power. The fact is, when you have these kinds of powers, there's a tendency to abuse them. Then Barack Obama became president, and a lot of these issues that had been hot issues during the Bush administration were not covered anymore. And a major reporter who I had, uh, who I had said at the, uh, before the Obama administration, I said, you know, a lot of this is political. It's not really that these people care about these rights, is that they want to use it to beat George W. Bush over the head. He came to me, and he covered these issues extensively for a major publication. He came to me afterward and he said, I thought that was just hyperbole on your part, but it may be true because these issues were not covered. And Barack Obama, as presidents always do, didn't back off, he doubled down. Uh, and yet it was covered differently. And I think that's a fact-based analysis where because a lot of people, for whatever reason, saw him as part of their team, and this includes people in the journalism profession, well, you know, we don't need to do that. We've done that before. Ruth? Well, I, I think that there may have been, I think that President Clinton may be a little bit right in terms of media who were pretty enamored of Barack Obama from the first time they saw him at the Democratic Convention um, giving his keynote address going a little bit easy on him. It certainly was not my experience with the Obama White House that they were pretty much ever happy with anything that I was writing about them. No White House ever. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I think they probably felt like, hey, why, why are you guys so hard on us? Because they probably perceived us to be incorrectly, uh, you know, on more of the same team. I think it's telling that President Clinton would see it that way because, you know, he was, he's on this kind of, uh, I was a victim of XYZ <laughs> tour going on and some of it is, oh, I had it so much harder than Barack Obama, so I take him with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, I think the more interesting question of, than whether we were to 
easy on Barack Obama is whether there's an element of us being too hard on President Trump. Uh, and that kind of gets me back to my what's the baseline. We can't, I really believe we can't grade the, this president or shouldn't grade this president or any president on a curve. We have this continuing series we're doing on the editorial page called What a Presidential President Would Have Said, where we sort of take a Trump moment and try to model like parents do what proper presidential behavior might look like. And, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't conflate, we shouldn't treat all Trump acts as heinous and respond to all of them at the you know, highest level of high C when some are what, as I said before, an ordinary Republican president would do that we would happen to disagree with. Would the regulatory policy of the EPA under President Romney really be that much different than it is under President Trump? Doesn't mean it's not worth writing about, it's just a question of kind of whether um, there is a degree of feeling besieged and frustrated and everything else in the media in terms of responding to Trump that's leading some people to respond to all Trump acts with the same kind of knee-jerkish reaction. And I think it's really worth for us to continue to think about as we try to cover him resolutely and aggressively, but also fairly. That's great. Um, let's switch gears here a little bit and think about the future of journalism. <laughs> Um, well Katrina's laughing. She's written <laughs> about this uh, a lot. She's talked about the fact that we need real reforms in media. Uh, we need real accountability-centered journalism, uh, not necessarily valuing profits over uh, public interest. We have six companies today in this country that own the vast majority of metropolitan newspapers and, and television stations. Uh, regional newspapers, etc. Uh, Sinclair, as we all know, has the potential to reach, I think it's 72% of all the households in America because of their ownership of television stations. Uh, so, do we need some antitrust enforcement? Uh, or should the government start uh, propping up independent journalists uh, and helping them out? And if you do either of those things, uh, how do you do uh, the, those things without risking uh, what I might call the slippery slope, the loss of state neutrality? So I may have been writing about this, but how one gets to where one sees a real future of a robust public interest journalism is a tough one in these times. But I do think we definitely need to revive antitrust and I, I say with some sense of encouragement that there are key Democrats who are reviving, and I think you're going to hear from Senator Warren after this, and she's been a big player in talking about the need to address this consolidation, not just of media, but of corporate power, um, with a vigorous, vibrant, robust antitrust structure. And by the way, that shouldn't be Republican or Democratic. I passed the, you know, think of Theodore Roosevelt, who was a fierce antitrust trust buster. Very tough, one can begin in the states maybe, but right now with the federal government we have and control of both houses, uh, it's, it's difficult. I also think though at the same time, we need, I, d I do need, and my colleague John Nichols has been writing about this for two decades. He's a founder of Free Press, a terrific organization which has fought the net neutrality consolidation battles. We do need to think about a way for citizens maybe to get a tax write off by contributing to certain media. The public CPB, Corporation for Public, public Broadcasting Experience in this country, has been a political football. But when people talk about the slippery slope, Terry, forgive me, and government control, look out across the industrialized, western, civilized world, and there are examples, and I won't do the cliche of the BBC, but I will, and there are other examples, where you do have some government funding, but decentralized and protected. But it's hard to see that right now, and I don't think it would fly with the Trump administration for-profit models. Former intern at The Nation founded the Marshall Project a few years ago, which has been doing terrific work. One of our editors just left us, sadly, to go uh, run a nonprofit 
criminal justice news organization called The Appeal. There are these models, ProPublica is probably one you may have heard of, investigative reporters and editors, but they're across the country and they're also operating in states because one of the things we forget is that corruption at the state local level can metastasize without some oversight, some media. So in states around this country, there are the beginnings of nonprofit models to make up only barely for the loss of state house reporters, for state reporters, and the decimation. And I'll end here, local news. It's not a perfect model, and I hate to kind of throw it out there, but what happened to the Washington Post with all the complexities, but Bezos buying it, putting, God, one hundred and tenth of his fortune into the Washington <laughs> Post and reviving a robust. If you could find civic-minded millionaires and billionaires across this country, like the Denver Post, which you may have followed. Denver Post, very good newspaper, has been ravaged by p private equity company. And these people of the private equity company live far away. If you could find people, not private equity, but people in a community who want to band together or who want to support papers, I think that would be a first step. I also think finally you got to find a way to claw back from Facebook because they have, Google's already set up a fund to support public interest journalism, but it's a tiny amount. But Facebook, Europe's ahead of us on this, both data privacy protection, but finding ways to shame or claw back from Facebook, which has take, took, as we've learned, took a model and has raked over our data and all of that. But to find funding from those sources for public interest journalism, these are first steps. But there's no silver bullet, excuse the. I find it interesting because those are those are often stated concerns and they're not they're not unimportant concerns, but we're talking about that at the same time that we're talking about this proliferation uh, out there and the breakdown of the old structure. I'll tell you, I don't know the answer, and I'm not going to claim I do, but I do know one thing I'm worried about, and that is when the government decides that it's going to start regulating the news uh, and say what's valid and what isn't. I didn't say that, and I, I think, know you. I, think, I know you didn't. I think governments, which are going to control, there is a move on, as you may know, for government to play a role with quote fake news and regulation. I think that's not. A well, we get you know just last week uh, the uh, the French president announced that the freedom of the press is so important, and then the next day. He announced that the government was going to set up a bureau to make sure that freedom of the press is used the way they want it used. I, th I, think, I, I think whatever the problems, whatever the, the chaos, whatever the abuses, uh, you know, the one thing you can say about people in Denver or Chicago or Washington, they're not the government. No, I'm and uh, I, I'd, I'd rather fight with them uh, and find, because and, you can find ways around it, you can find ways to communicate. We're, that, that's one of the th things we talked about earlier is getting around uh, the existing media. The American people are inventive, the technology hasn't ended, these things will sort themselves out and they'll do it in a, I have great faith in a much, in a much better way than would, uh, than would happen if the government decided to get into it and, and, uh, and help. And especially when you've had the president talking about licensing is, um, you know, yeah. yanking licenses and, you know, it's, pardon me, but right. very Nixonian conversations and threats like that. Uh, the l last model that I would look to would be um, government support and government funding because you are going to inevitably go down a very dangerous slope on that. I think Katrina puts her finger on the thing that wor kind of worries me most about the journalism landscape out there, which is the evaporation of coverage of state and local governments, because if you don't have reporters covering state houses, you're going to have rampant corruption at state houses, just like if you don't tend your garden, it's going to just get really noxious weeds all over. The um, really bright thing that I would say in an otherwise very difficult business climate for journalism has been the growth of subscription models. As young people get used to paying for things on the internet, whether it's their Netflix or their Hulu or their whatever, they're also getting used to paying for news. So you see at the New York Times, the Washington Post, 
other places that have put in paywalls. People are understanding if you value this, you need to pay for it. And that, to me, is the best way to ensure our future is um, we can't all have a Jeff Bezos, but if we got two million of them um, paying a little bit, that's the way to get it, keep, to be able to keep it going in a climate where the rest of the business model has just collapsed. So, so Ruth, do you think that the president's attacks on Amazon um, are connected to Mr. Bezos' uh, ownership of your paper? Well, I think I um, renounced my ability to um, <laughs> read the president's mind. <laughs> but I think that um, the facts kind of speak for themselves. Um, he has called it the Amazon Washington Post, so I would leave it to you to make the make that connection. And um, but is that you know I, I ask it really in a more serious vein? Is that not a little frightening to all of us about the threat to the First Amendment uh, that that is a veiled threat? But I find the net neutrality, I come back to it, today is a historic and not a happy day. I mean, the ending of net neutrality by an FCC, which has really been taken over by telecom, not public interest, is potentially very dangerous. There may be, we were told there were going to be, you know, this great flourishing on the internet. That could be shut down. I mean, it's kind of becomes pay to play, who can afford. It's a civil rights issue. It's a digital divide issue. It is a free speech issue. And we haven't seen it, the full results yet, but we have to fight hard as best we can, again, state level, attorneys generals, to retrieve some of that. But that is part of, like the US post office, postal service, which the nation, by the way, the nation has championed. Whenever we do a story on the US postal service, it's like clickbait at the nation, got me, I don't know what's, I don't know what's going wrong or right. But, um, that's a very tricky thing for a lot of publications, even though print, people say, is dying. But when they jack up the prices or they go to five, six days a week, that's also part of the public interest shutdown. You have to do that in order to, for Amazon to be able to deliver their stuff. The privatization <laughs> delivery. Well, I mean, what